Well, Ryan, what's on your radar? Well, the fight over inflation is getting as hot as inflation itself. And it's one of the most consequential arguments we're having today, because if you believe that inflation is the result of workers having too much money, having too much purchasing power and bargaining power as a result, then the answer is to make sure that workers make less money. Now, there are two ways to do that. One is the simple way of cutting back on help. No more direct checks, no more extra unemployment, no more child tax credit, etc. The other way is to raise interest rates, which slows the economy and throws people out of work. With more unemployed people, workers can no longer bargain for higher wages, and with lower wages, they have less money to spend and prices come down. So that's the orthodox Reaganomics approach, and it's still the one that many politicians are calling for. But the truth is that wages are way too low, not too high. Now, if you accept that Reagan-era view of the economy, you're saying that workers having a few extra dollars in their bank accounts for a few months simply isn't something that we can tolerate. That's not a world that I want to live in. To me, rising wages are good, something we should fight for, not against. Now, in order to have rising wages without seeing inflation, the productivity of the economy has to be distributed to the workers themselves who produce all of that growth. Instead, the growth currently flows up to the top 1%, and rising wages get eaten up by rising prices. Rising inequality then produces a toxic political culture that divides people along culture war lines and allows the richest of the rich to quietly walk off the political battlefield, leaving everybody else to fight over scraps. That means that if workers want to continue improving their material lives, they need to make sure the economy keeps growing, but the gains are distributed downwards. And that's not going to happen on the trajectory we're on. And much of that is explained by former UK central banker Charles Goodhart. So at 85, He's now looking back at the last several decades of fairly stable prices and seeing an anomaly and warning that the labor shortages we're experiencing now are going to drive inflation for the next several decades, particularly as baby boomers continue to retire and consume far more than they produce. The answer for the U.S. is one the right wing doesn't want to hear, immigration, both high skilled and low skilled. Now, the resistance to immigration that many workers feel is rooted in a fear that these new workers will either take their jobs or push their wages down. But that's not how it works in an era of labor shortages. Without new workers, the economy will shrink. And yes, workers will have leverage, but they'll also have leverage in a crappy economy amid high inflation that gobbles up the raises they can get thanks to their leverage. The rich would prefer that the economy grow rather than shrink, but they're rich either way. Workers need productivity growth if they're going to improve their situation. Now, you might think that by restricting immigration, you're actually helping a worker who's already here. But if that immigration would have fueled growth that creates new jobs, and instead you don't have that growth and you don't have those jobs, you actually screwed that worker over when you thought you were helping them. And so the country over the next few decades that it can attract the most immigrant talent is going to be the one that continues to grow and one in which domestic workers have a chance to do the best. That'll require them teaming up with the new workers to organize against the elites. But without these new workers, there won't be much of a pie to fight over. One country that understands this is Germany, and it's now trying to recruit up to 400,000 skilled workers a year. But because of political, cultural, and bureaucratic obstacles, they're only likely to hit about half of that. So with bitterness over the 2015 refugee crisis still simmering, they're going to have a hard time meeting that. Now, one advantage the U.S. has over a country like Germany is that far more people around the world have a grasp of English than German. And relative to much of the rest of the world, the U.S. can be a pretty good place to live, which will remain a major competitive advantage we have in the coming competition. The question is whether we want to take advantage of it or want to cut off our nose to spite our face. So ultimately, this, this, to me, this comes down to economic growth. What kind of economy is going to be best for people who are already here? And it's true that there will be less competition for jobs if we can build walls and keep everybody out. But there will also be many fewer jobs. So, so how, do you, how do you manage that trade-off? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm with you that we, we need to continue allowing immigration, for sure. I think a lot of countries like Germany, as you pointed out, um, as their own population becomes more educated, you know, Germans, they have, uh, I believe it's in their constitution that education is a right over there, so they're all very educated, because um, anybody, even international students get education, I think, there for free. So as they become more educated and they're taking these high-skilled jobs, they don't have people to take the lower-skilled jobs that typically, you know, blue-collar jobs, I would say. So they've said, we need to immigrate people in. Um, and so they have taken a, a million Syrians and other refugees. Um, and they freaked out about it. And, right, a lot of people did. And then same thing in the Nordic countries. They were like, we're losing population. They're trying to start to pay people to have children, mm -hmm. right? And right. then they said, we've got to import people in. And of course, people do freak out about that. So as societies become more first world and more advanced, they definitely need to somehow open up the doors and, because people just have fewer kids. Yeah. You know, my dad is one of seven. China even. Right, right. And then people, yeah, and then people start to have fewer and fewer children. But my question is, you know, in, when you compare Germany to the United States, how, what is their unemployment like? Because we still do have unemployed people here in the United States. So before we could, I think, make the case to bring in others, we need to figure out why we have certain levels of, of unemployment get them and, and get these people skilled enough. Now, is it because they're mentally ill and they can't work? Is it because they're older, you know, nearing retirement and they don't want to work anymore, so, but they still count in the unemployment range? Well, yeah, at the, at the height, it, labor force participation, I think, is almost exactly where it was at the beginning of the pandemic, if, if that's what you mean by the people who have stopped looking. But as far as people who are looking, like at the height of the Great Recession, there was something like six or seven people looking for every job opening. Mm -hmm. We now have something like three jobs for every one person looking, which is a huge swing in just 15 years or so. Yeah, I'm, you know, very supportive of immigration. I, I think there tend to be three arguments against uh, bringing in more immigrants. Um, the economic arguments, I, I really don't accept because like you, I think that Right, we would bring them in and it would create a lot of economic growth and then maybe we have to be concerned about who benefits from that economic growth, but there's really, there's really no argument on the other side. It does create a lot of economic growth. There are jobs we need immigrants to do. The other two arguments, one is cultural and one is sort of like terrorism related. I don't really buy the cultural argument either. The concerns that many on the right have that immigrants are gonna you know, impact our, our culture changes. A lot of the immigrants, at least that we're getting to the United States, are conservative, <laughs> are, are, are religious and uh, and anti-socialist, as if they're coming from Latin America. The the only semi-legitimate, I think, ar argument against immigration or reason to be concerned uh, is that is the terrorism uh, kind of category, which doesn't apply so much to us. But I can understand, you know, Europe being afraid to take in. Maybe it was the right thing to do, and they should still do it nevertheless, but like the Syrian refugees, for instance, concerns that there would be terrorists among them, that sort of thing. I, so I don't, I'm not going to totally dismiss that one. I think national security reasons are valid, and governments can make rules or look at how, what do we do to keep the country safe. I think they go way too far on that usually. Uh, but the economic and cultural reasons I find right. even less compelling. That's interesting. I actually think it's the other way around. That's well, yeah, good. We I, disagree. You're right. I, I actually think the terrorism aspect is not something we really need to worry too much about. I mean, I know that there are terrorist attacks that happen. They are in Europe, obviously, way more so than here. Uh, we could make the argument that it's because of these immigrants that come in. But I actually think it's because of the culture of Europe where they don't fully integrate people into society, like in France. You're French if you're French, but you're not really French if you're not born there, even if you've only ever been in France. Italians have a similar mentality, so they have a little bit more of a, uh, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're very proud of their culture, whereas America's a bit different. We're more of a country of immigrants. So I don't think people coming in from other countries would feel as oppressed necessarily and would feel as uh, othered. And so in I don't US. think they would, in the U.S., right. and so I don't think that there would be as large of a threat of terrorism. I actually think there's more of a threat of the cultural, and I don't think that liberals take this as seriously enough. And I think it's for the reasons you pointed out, where you say a lot of these immigrants are conservative, right? right. I'm not concerned about the impact, the, the, the I, impact they're going to have on our, our culture. Well, but maybe you would as a libertarian, because a lot of them coming in from South America, for example, are very pro-life. 
And so, you know, California, for example, we're bringing in so many people from Latin America, and they very well could change the dynamic of the political structure in California where they say, yeah, we are actually more pro-life than we are pro-choice now. There's more of us than there are of you on this particular issue. And a lot of them might vote Democrat. They might have a lot of Democratic values in other ways, but there are certain cultural issues where they are more conservative. And I think liberals don't take that seriously enough. A lot of people from around the world are not as open to LGBTQ. They're just not. And we have to... Well, they're getting more so. They're getting more so. Yeah. Of course, people as, you know, exposure... The first generation of immigrants are not, but then their right. kids are and yeah. their grandkids. Well, maybe, sometimes. I mean, but, it, it, you know, it's a slow... It's a, it's, it's yeah. slow. It takes a few generations to kind of get people to change their minds on those things that they were raised with. And so I actually think liberals don't take the culture aspect uh, really seriously right. enough. That's a good point. And I think on both of those fronts, we have enough to worry about from people born in America. Like, I, I always find it funny, a country that has something like 400 million weapons worried about dangerous people coming into the country. Right. It's like, <laughs> calls coming from inside the house. Yeah. And separately, we've got our own homegrown uh, anti-abortion movement that's doing quite well. That definitely would be buttressed by some more support, but they're they're on a roll. Uh, as, you know, they control the Supreme Court. They control half the country at this point. Right. I. Yeah. I'm I'm saying to the right, who is very concerned about immigrant, that right. Republicans they, will never right. win if we be, bring in all these right. immigrants. I'm like, I'm looking what what these immigrants think on yeah. on your issues, and if anything, it's the reverse. Right. Register them right. immediately before yeah. they have kids, right. and their kids vote for the Democrats. That's why yeah. I'm hoping Republicans don't catch on to this, because I think yeah. if, if if Republicans realize, wait a minute, a lot of these people are super conservative, and they started to embrace them more and bring them into the fold, then we might see. Uh, more change uh, towards conservative. The GOP yeah. hasn't caught on yet. No. So, so. No, they, they'd rather lie to the HVAC repair guy and say <laughs> that his problems are the result of people crawling over the wall. Yeah, to get his vote instead right. of all the people right. coming into the country. Right. Doesn't make any sense. But we're looking forward to your radar coming up next, Kim.